Okay, just let us know when you're recorded there. Yeah. We're good to go. So that's us. Okay, good morning. <laughs> so, Stuart, can we call for the Sudan and the apologies, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Sudan, uh, Councillor Lillian Jones. Thank you, Councillor Neil Watts. Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor David Richardson. Present. Thank you. Councillor Stephen Canning. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter Mabin. Yeah, present. Thank you. Councillor Beverly Clark. Present. Thank you. Councillor Sally Cogley. Here. Thank you. Councillor William Lennox. Here. Thank you. Councillor June Kyle. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jennifer Hogg. Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Elaine Stewart. Councillor Stewart. Yeah, I can see you're here, Councillor Stewart. Can't hear you. OK, thank you. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you very much. So welcome back, everybody, after the Christmas and New Year break. OK, so declarations of interest. Do we have to have any this morning? OK, Councillor Kayo. Regarding the, the school report, the, uh, and, sorry, Mrs McLean's, <laughs> I've known her since she was a baby, close family friends. Just think, congratulations to her, well done. Take that as a connection in terms of not one that would require you to withdraw, but it's declaring the connection, so we'll work it that way. Thank you. Any other declarations of interest? No. Okay. So we'll move on to item three, and that's Muir Primary School and the Early Childhood Centre HMIE inspection. Over to you, Graham. Is that right? Thanks, Chair. Morning, members and colleagues. I'm delighted to be at Governance and Scrutiny Committee this morning and joined by Anne McLean, who's who's online. Uh, Anne will join us just as we go through the, the report. I um, don't know if you want to come on. There's Anne now. Uh, welcome, Anne. Good to see you this morning. Anne will come in during the report. So just to highlight then, the purpose of the report is to provide uh, members with the findings of the report from Education Scotland inspectors following their inspection of Muirkirk Primary School and Early Childhood Centre. Paragraph two highlights the recommendations um, that we'll come back to at the end of the report. And the aims of the inspection are detailed in paragraphs three to eight. Just, I would like to highlight this was a full inspection and there were four quality indicators evaluated and I'm sure Anne will, will tell us uh, a bit more about that as, as we go through the report. Uh, a fairly detailed inspection, very thorough um, and Anne will certainly testify to that. The inspection process is detailed in paragraphs 9 to 12 and I'm delighted to say that HMI won't be returning to the school. The report does highlight the strengths of the school's work, as well as areas where continued improvement could be made. And just to highlight for members, it's normal for areas for improvement to be identified in inspection reports. It's not unique to, to Muir Kirk's report, that, that's usual practice. I'll hand over to Anne shortly to provide some feedback from the inspection report. But before I do it, I would like to highlight that we consider this to be a very positive report, and it's testament to Anne's leadership that the, the inspection report has been so positive. Uh, I know Anne won't say this, she's, she's very modest but uh, and humble, but Anne has made a significant impact within the school uh, and the wider community, and that's played a significant part in achieving this positive inspection report. So I'll hand over to Anne to take us through the findings of the report, but, but well done, Anne. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Graham. Okay, over to you, Mrs McLean. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, yes, so the the HMI inspection did go very well. Um, we, we were only a matter, it was our first week back actually from the summer holidays when we got the notification that we were going to be inspected. So, um, <laughs> yep, it was uh, quite a significant <laughs> stressful time. However, um, the report went very, very well. Um, HMI came out and they classed our leadership of change is good, teaching, learning and assessment good, ensuring well-being, equality and inclusion is very good and raising attainment and achievement 
also good. That was exactly the same for the ECC that's part of the building. Um, very, very proud of the fact that this, the co comments throughout the report reported on the children and the children in the school and the early childhood centre who were proud of being in Muirkirk, just like myself. And I have to say all the staff who work here. Uh, we've done a lot of work in Muirkirk around values and vision, and that was also commented on um, the children are actually living and demonstrating the values of the school and have a so strong sense of belonging. Um, we got very good for the well-being, equity and inclusion. And again, it was commented that all members of staff have contributed to that uh, and contributed to having a nurturing and inclusive uh, environment for all our children and staff's shared responsibility for the for well-being um, became evident and that was one of the things that I have to say I'm most proud of because throughout the school it is about having that safe place for all our children and ensuring that we're getting it right for every one of them. Um, that we uh, we use our professional learning to better meet the needs of the children and that we have really strong partnerships with the local community that are enhanced, enhancing our learning activities. Um, being in a small village school, you know, we are at the very heart of the community. So um, we really do have really strong community links and the community are very much part of the school. Um, a couple of things that we were asked just to uh, improve and have a wee look at moving forward is just to continue um, doing what we were doing and leading changes across the school um, and making sure that we're gathering the right evidence that's having impact on the children. Also, um, providing opportunities for children to be a bit more independent and in thinking for themselves. Uh, so we were really delighted that the, the HMI felt that we had no room uh, for them to come back, thank goodness. And um, they actually highlighted, apparently in um, HMI inspection reports, they don't always highlight um, evidence of good practice. Uh, so that was um, really, really um fantastic for us because as part of that process they highlighted the the fact of our well-being equality and inclusion as <clears throat> a very good practice and that's noted in the report um so at, we've sh I've sh we've shared this at head teachers meetings also and we've shared all, all of what's in the report with our parents and the community and just absolutely delighted to have the, under my belt my first as a head teacher, I have to say. So it was a uh, very positive. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, and that was a it is a really good report. Um, and thanks for speaking to the report as well and yourself, Graham. Um, I actually read the the inspection report online, and you could see. And you could feel that the school is at the heart of the community and the community is very proud of the school and of their their, their children. Um, I was particularly pleased to see that um, the learning leadership skills that the pupils were learning um, and developed that they took it to a, you know, they had a community project, you know, which raised the profile of the mental health within that community. Could you just tell me a wee bit more about that, please? Because I think that's a fantastic, a fantastic thing. Yeah. Um, through Columba 1400, the primary five sixes at the time were involved in a leadership project and they had to come up with a project that they had to lead and develop within the school and within the school community. So the class um, chose mental well-being and not just the mental well-being of the school. It was actually taking it out so that it would reach parents and reach the, the local community. So they called that project Dinny Hodger Wished. Um, and it was about encouraging uh, people to talk to each other. Um, and through the school app and through the community window, we um, have got really good relationships with one of the local businessmen. And we 
commandeered his window to put information, posters, um, uh, QR codes for people to scan, and um, we used it uh, for the children to pass on uh, lots of information and supports to the local community about mental health. So, for example, one day it was um, encouraging the pe pe people to talk to each other. Um, another, another, another one was a joke a day, and we had videos of the children telling jokes to raise a smile. We had the children making videos about resilience and how to deal with certain situations with, again, QR codes for the local community to um, scan and, and look at that. We had self-help information, um, also information referred to if you needed to talk to somebody, where you could go. So it was really, really positively received by the whole community. Um, not just uh, not just our parents and the children, um, but the local community very much got behind that. Um, and we know that we hope that it's had an impact. Parents and the local community in our evaluation have told us, you know, that they learned such a lot from the children. And it was great to see the children leading learning um, and, you know, that they they did get something out of it. So it was a, it was a fantastic project that we're building on um, and trying to continue just to make we're on a kind of roll with it and we just want to develop it even more through having coffee mornings and talk shops and, and so on. It's absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much, Anne. I've got councillors Lennox, Cogley, Stewart and then Watts. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd, I'd just like to congratulate uh, Mrs McLean, the staff and pupils at Mirkirk Primary School for such a, an excellent result. Um, it's evident that that just doesn't happen overnight and it takes years and years of uh, building up the, uh, the expertise to get to those level of results. I think the, uh, the results also reflect the community spirit that's evident in uh, the, village of, uh, the village of Mirkirk. Um, that's evident when we go to the community councils, etc. up there. So very well done um, and thanks again for all your hard work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Lennox. Okay, Councillor Cogley. Yes, um, j just to add to that, thank you very much. It's 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 an absolute pleasure to see you here, and your enthusiasm shines out of you. So thank you very much. Just wanted to add to that. Thanks, Councillor Cogley. Okay, Councillor Stewart. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Just again, um, brilliant and uh, it's a great report and um, it's great to see that you're sharing your experience and expertise with other schools so that will help them all. Um, and one of the points that i seen raised in it was um, the journey that the children have been on and they're going to be taking that to the Scottish Learning Festival. So that's a great achievement in itself. So absolutely well done. Um, on page three of the report, it states that the teachers and support staff don't have the quality time to plan learning activities together. So what are we going to put in place for that? And I know you'll do it, um, but just um, let, us, let us know how you're going to take that, them on that journey. We've already started that. Um, Thursday at this point is our uh, non-class contact time for the whole school. So there's an assembly ongoing at the moment and myself and my deputy actually take that assembly. And at that point, we allow the classroom assistants to be in with the teachers that they work with and make plans for the week ahead so that they're absolutely sure about what they're doing in the week ahead. And although that may change because things change on a daily basis, but so that if there's anything that classroom assistants need to go and look out, need to photocopy, need to go and source, that they've got this, it's a 50 minute block and they have that block every Thursday. So we've actually moved with that. Um, and reporting back, um, everyone seems to think that it is having an impact part because there's there's no more of the wee quick few minute conversations at the, the start of a lesson there's less interruption to learning so it's going well so far fabulous great well done again thanks councillor stewart councillor watts 
thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to say a very well, a very big well done to Anne and her team. Um, it's a fantastic report, um, and they've obviously worked extremely hard um, within the school to get that. So, yeah, a big well done. Big well done, Anne. Thanks, Councillor Watts. Anybody else? Any comments? I've just got another comment. As part of the the inspection report online, you know, it's it states that there's 32 percent of the school role with additional support needs. So that in itself, and to come away with a report like this is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I had I mentioned to Graham at one of the pre meetings, um, the values, Mr. Sharp. So it's absolutely fantastic that all your pupils are successful, happy, achieving, respectful and positive, and that they, they demonstrate the values every day at school and indeed every day in their lives. So absolutely fantastic. And yes, we do congratu congratulate yourself, your colleagues and the pupils and indeed the wider community for your continued commitment to the pupils and the children within that area. So thanks very much. OK, thank does anybody? Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me here today. Oh, you're very welcome. Anytime. Thank Anything. you. <laughs> OK, folks, you'll have noticed that I skipped the minutes, the previous minutes from the previous meeting. I was getting ahead of myself. So if we can just jump back to item two and can we approve the minutes as a correct record? Yep. Are there any matters arising from that minute? No? OK. So then we shall move on to item four. And we've got Helen to take that report, which is the annual return on the Scottish Social Housing Charter annual performance report to tenants 2022. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members and colleagues. The purpose of the report is to provide an update to committee with regard to the annual return on the Scottish Social Housing Charter submitted to the Scottish Housing Regulator in May 2022 and to update members with regard to the annual performance report to tenants published in October 2022. Recommendations are noted at paragraph two of the report. To provide background, the Housing Scotland Act 2010 introduced the Scottish Social Housing Charter with the first charter coming in, into effect on the 1st of April 2012. A revised charter was approved on the 5th of October 2022 and became effective from the 1st of November 2022. And this sets out the standards and outcomes which social landlords should be aiming to achieve for their tenants, service users and other customers in carrying out their housing activities. Paragraph 4 sets out the outcomes and themes within the Scottish Social Housing Charter. Paragraphs 5 to 7 discuss the responsibility of Scottish social landlords to meet the charter outcomes and standards and that to monitor landlords' achievement of the outcomes and standards, the Scottish Housing Regulator requires landlords to complete an annual return on the charter by May each year. The annual return measures and assesses performance in progressing towards or achieving the charter outcomes and standards through key performance information, which is then used to publicly report on each landlord's progress and to inform the local scrutiny plan. Tenants, customers and social landlords are able to compare performance information submitted through the annual return in the charter with other Scottish landlords. Paragraphs 8 to 10 set out the timeline for submission of the Council's annual return in the Charter and the consultation and collaboration with representatives from the East Ayrshire Federation of Tenants and Residents and tenant representatives prior to its submission to the Scottish Housing Regulator in May 2022. Last September, the Scottish Housing Regulator published landlord reports for all social landlords which provide information on 15 key indicators benchmarked against the Scottish average performance. Paragraphs 11 to 16 describe the key service areas and indicators which were identified by tenants as being the information they wanted included in the annual performance report to tenants. The East Ayrshire Federation of Tenants and Residents and Tenants and Residents Groups 
agreed the satisfaction indicators, which would then provide them with the required information so as to assess the effectiveness of East Ayrshire Council as a landlord. In 2020, Knowledge Partnership was commissioned to undertake a tenant satisfaction survey on behalf of the Council. This work concluded in November 2020 and the findings were reported to Cabinet in February 2021. The relevant satisfaction indicators pertaining to the survey formed part of the Council's annual return charter submission in May 2022. The next large scale survey will take place later this year. You'll note the Council's performance against each satisfaction indicator from 2016-17 through to 2021-22, which overall is above the Scottish Local Authority average. Three indicators have reduced since the last large-scale survey. This outcome may have been influenced by the COVID-19 restrictions in place at the time and the methodology used in the 2020 survey. However, as part of the Tenant Satisfaction Survey Action Plan, and objectives contained therein, it is anticipated that in areas of reported reduced performance, the results will, will improve ahead of the next large-scale survey. This activity includes performance meetings, targeting indicators where performance has reduced, and the introduction of the Independent Tenants and Residents Forum to promote tenant participation. The findings of the survey overall were very positive in relation to satisfaction with service delivery with 91.9% .9 very or fairly satisfied overall. The Council continues to work in partnership with the Federation of Tenants and Residents and any interested tenants to increase participation and engagement with the housing service through the development and implementation of the action plan, which was agreed by a collaborative working group as well as ongoing and future scrutiny exercises. Paragraph 17 discusses how neighbourhood coaches continue to provide advice and assistance to tenants through challenging times, seeking to build relationships with our tenants. Paragraph 18 states how the Federation of Tenants and Residents' continued approach to tenant scrutiny and participation has been invaluable in shaping improvements across all of our services. The Federation participated in the review and development of the new Scottish Social Housing Charter and they are currently working with the Scottish Government on rent affordability across Scotland. Paragraph 19 discusses our performance within the 2020 Tenant Satisfaction Survey, which was reduced slightly in relation to the management of the neighbourhood. Our position in comparison to the Scottish national average is favourable, with a number of targeted actions contained within the report's action plan. The feedback from the Women's Safety in Our Community Survey of 2021 provides further scope for environmental improvements. Paragraphs 22 to 27 discuss performance in the repairs and housing quality and maintenance indicators. While indicator 8, average length of time taken to complete emergency repairs, and indicator 9, average length of time taken to complete non-emergency repairs have increased, all continue to perform better than the Scottish Local Authority average across the same period, and actions have been highlighted to improve service performance in these areas. The indicators relating to neighbourhood and community and access to housing and support are set out in paragraphs 28 to 38. Improved performance in meeting antisocial behaviour targets is noted when compared with the Scottish Local Authority average, which is highlighted at indicator 15. Performance at indicator 17, which is the percentage of lettable houses that became vacant in the last year, has increased slightly to 8.3%. However, it is significantly lower than the 2016-17 figure of 11.5%. The Housing As Asset Management Framework process continues to assess and annually review a wide variety of measures to rationalise all stock, thereby helping to improve this indicator. Other improvement activities that are underway include service improvement groups and tenant-led scrutiny groups, which will include a review of the new void business unit. You'll note an increased percentage of the core actions initiated, which resulted in eviction at indicator 22, 
However, it should be noted that there has been a significant reduction in the number of core actions raised from 242 actions in 2019-20 to 28 actions in 21-22. And the number of evic evictions decreased from 40 to 7 within the same period. This is due in part to revised rent recovery procedures introduced in 2020 during the pandemic, which aim to maximise income for our tenants and reduce financial insecurity. And also the close working with our partners, including the, the, the Universal Credit Support Team and Financial Inclusion Team. The rent collected and gross rent arrears, both as a percentage of total rent due, are favourable compared to the Scottish average. Performance in relation to void rent loss has improved with a decrease in the percentage of rent lost through properties being empty during the last year. Our regeneration strategy linked to the housing asset management framework has shown significant improvements in letting long term voids with numerous positive impacts felt by communities when these properties are relet. And in 2021-22, 87.7% of void properties were relet in under 16 weeks. Paragraphs 39 to 41 discuss the annual performance report to tenants, which was issued last October and meets the Scottish Housing Regulator requirements with a revised and condensed version, which is easier to read. The East Ayrshire Federation of Tenants and Residents, along with tenants and residents groups, agreed the key areas and indicators which were included in the report. The Federation is involved in performance monitoring of both housing and housing asset services through their attendance and input at our performance meetings and through the development of the tenant scrutiny subgroups which aim to review processes, make recommendations for improvement and highlight areas of good practice. Moving on to implications, there are no policy implications as a result of these papers within legal implications both the annual return in the Charter and annual performance report to tenants meet the requirements of the Scottish Housing Regulators Framework, the Scottish Social Housing Charter and the requirements as set out in the Housing Scotland Act of 2010. There are no human resource implications and as part of the local housing strategy assessment, there are no negative impacts on equality groups. There are no direct financial implications all expenditure in relation to the production and distribution of the annual report to tenants is met from current budgets. The annual return on the Charter and annual performance report to tenants contribute to the Council's community planning themes of safer communities and wellbeing. The Council's sustainability, climate change and carbon emissions and fuel poverty reduction targets and proposals to deliver net zero housing, as well as carbon dioxide emissions, energy for space heating and fire suppression measures should have positive impacts across performance indicators. To conclude, both the annual return in the Charter and the annual performance report to tenants meet the requirements of the Scottish Housing Regulator. The annual performance report to tenants provides robust information to allow for a good understanding by tenants of how East Ayrshire Council is performing as a landlord and it facilitates better scrutiny of our landlord activities. Following the Tenant Satisfaction Survey of 2020, Housing Services colleagues, together with the Federation, continue to focus on indicators where performance can be improved as part of the revised action plan. The performance information contained in the report shows a positive trend with the majority of indicators showing improvement or that the Council is operating at a similar level to previous years. Work is now underway to prepare for the annual return in the Charter submission and the new annual assurance statement for 2022-23 and we will liaise with the regulator and provide key quarterly performance information with regular monitoring and reporting of indicators through the Council's electronic performance management system. Members will note the background papers listed at the end of the report and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. It's a, a, it's a very detailed report of our performance and um, it's good to see that 
on most of our indicators, we are above the Scottish national um, average, which is good. And um, there's a couple there that slip behind, but you know, I take the point that that could be due to COVID, and I'm quite sure there was a lot of other authorities um, find themselves in the same position there. Um, see, just on the paragraph seven. Um, in relation to the local area network. So in terms of the local scrutiny plan, did the Scottish Housing Regulator identify any risks based on the info provided within the annual return on the charter? Was there any risks identified? Through you, Chair, no, no risks identified for us. Thanks very much. Does anybody else have any questions or points on to raise? Councillor Stewart. Yeah, I'm just um, to ask you how many um, residents associations are right across the authority and are there any in the Dune Valley? Because um, one of my queries would be um, on the antisocial behaviour. Um, in the last six months, I've had loads of phone calls about antisocial behaviour and I know you can't make, you can't make a tenants association in the Dune Valley area, um, but if there's no yen, how would we get that information? You, Thank you, Councillor Stewart. It's a really good point. Um, tenant participation is a challenge for us. Since COVID, we found that a number of groups across the authority have perhaps fallen away, perhaps because obviously the restrictions in place, they couldn't facilitate face-to-face -face meetings. So we have recognised that the Dune Valley is an area where we want to focus on tenant participation and engagement. The East Ayrshire Federation, they've identified a range of actions where they want to increase their digital presence by promoting Facebook and also their face-to-face -face presence in the Dune Valley. Also, our customer liaison officer has identified a range of actions to liaise with our registered social landlords who operate in the Dune Valley, but also direct contact through at any point where we're liaising with our tenants, it's about gauging interest and participating in the decisions that the council make or the housing service makes. So it's certainly an area that we've identified through the action plan and also the review of the tenant participation strategy is going to be taking place later this year. So we'll certainly be reaching out to tenants within the Dune Valley. Thank you. Yeah, all right, that Councillor Stewart, you want to come back in? You okay? Okay. Helen, see just in terms of the large scale survey that was undertaken in 2020, and we received the 669 responses. From that information, do we get the areas where those responses came from? It's just so we have that information? Yes, we do. Did it cover from one end to the other end of the local authority? Yes, yes, it was across the local authority. Unfortunately, at the time, because the survey has to be undertaken every three years, it was during the time where restrictions were still in place and the survey had to be undertaken over the telephone. We always find that these surveys are best undertaken face to face. And uh, but yes, absolutely, it was across the local authority. So going forward, there's a possibility where we could be chapping people's doors in face to face. Yes, conversations the, with them. Through you, Chair, yes, absolutely. We will be seeking to start the, the process with our colleagues in procurement to have the survey carried out. I would anticipate August, September of this year. So, and just, just in the back of that, so based on the amount of tenants that we've got, 12,060, I think, was in your report, <clears throat> do we have a target? Who we reach, of how many we reach to give us a good sample to be able to base our performance and you know and get a good sense of direction of where we're going. Through you, Chair, yes, we would be aiming for a minimum of 10% of our tenants. That's the number that we actually reached for the 1718 um survey. I think our, I mean I went into the issue seven of the performance um, reports to tenants. That's that's the amount of responses that we received for that large scale um, survey at that point. So 
we were bang on there. But I'm just going to slip back. Obviously, COVID, and you've explained that, and that's perfectly reasonable. Um, but certainly, you know, to have that targeting above would be better because a larger sample size obviously gives us more information. Do you, Chair? Absolutely. We'd we'll be seeking within the procurement exercise to ensure that we have maximum reach to tenants. We have no restrictions in place that would would hinder any face-to-face -face visits and we'd be looking for the organisation um, through that procurement exercise to, to set out their plan and, and how they would be engaging with our tenants. Okay, so, Councillor Cannon. Thanks. Um, just a quick um, sort of information. In paragraph 15, it talks about the introduction of the Independent Tenants and Residents Forum. Maybe we could just elaborate on that and just what is it and what does it do? Thanks. Through you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Canning. Yes, we recognise that a lot of tenants and residents don't wish to form uh, an actual registered group as such, but we do have uh, a large number of tenants who wish to participate on an individual basis. So it's giving the forum to be able to contact us, to receive information, to be involved in scrutiny exercises, to influence any, any policies that are, are going to be reviewed. So it's been recognised that this forum will, will be the vehicle for tenants to be involved. And there'll be the Federation are, are planning the, the promotion of the, of the forum as well through their newsletters, which are issued to, to all tenants in East Ayrshire. Thanks. And so just one more thing I'd quite like to see. I think the last time I spoke to Bruce, the Tenants and Residents of Federation, I think the, um, there weren't any um, in ANIC either. So I'd quite like to see a push there for the same reasons Elaine is outlining in terms of antisocial behaviour. So thanks. Through you, Chair. Yes, absolutely. We, we recognise that tenant participation has uh, decreased slightly through the number of groups that we have, but we know the areas that we wish to target. Um, especially when it comes to, to state management concerns that our tenants may have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Let me come in. Councillor Cogley, then Councillor Hogg. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Helen. I've got two questions, one in relation to Indicator 22 and another question in relation to Indicator 30. So Indicator 22 talks about the percentage of court actions resulting in eviction. And for the year 21-22, we were 25%. Now, just in terms of numbers, um, how many households, well, how many court actions were there? How many ho households were, were, were evicted, please? Thank you. Do you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cogley. There were 28 actions raised in that year and it resulted in seven evictions. And that was a, a decrease from 28 in the previous year. Thank you. Well, but I can see the previous year, I think it was, uh, was naught, which presumably was COVID re related. Uh, so of those seven households that were evicted, what actually happened to, to, to those people? So you chair, Councillor Cogley, out of the seven households, two of the households were evicted for extreme antisocial behaviour and the remaining five were evicted for rent arrears. Having looked at the cases and undertaken some scrutiny of the households and their tenancy record, I can confirm that the minimum amount of rent arrears, it was just over £4,000 um, for one of the households. In terms of these households, none of them have presented as homeless to housing options at the current time. So these are households who we obviously worked with as much as we could to try and keep them in their homes, but unfortunately, um, we had to obviously go through the, the processes that we have in place to recover debt and recover our tenancy. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much, Helen, for that. And my second question is indicator 30, um, the average length of time taken to relet properties. So for the, for the uh, um, 
the most recent one, I'm just struggling to see what the, oh, 21, 22, that was 72 days. That seems to me to be quite a long time when we know there are a, a, a large number of people on the housing register. Could you tell us a little about that, please? Through you, Chair, yes, of course, Councillor Cogley. You'll see that um, two years prior to that, the figure was 46.3 days on average, which was um, a, a very good year for us. Unfortunately, COVID and the pandemic impacted us with our relight times, especially um, some of the impacts as well with, with Brexit and um, the supply of materials to be able to turn over these properties as quickly as we could. Encouragingly, though, having looked at the relight times for this year, we are currently at period nine. It was that our figure was 57.1 average days. So you'll note that to go from 72.2 in average and down to the current position of 57.1, of we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And do you think that the new um, computerised, the, the, the electronic housing system will actually um, reduce that even further? Through you, Chair. Councillor Cogley, yes, I absolutely believe it will. The, the new application system will allow tenants to make informed choices. They'll be able to update their own housing application details um, at any time through the, the computerised system. It won't rely on um, contact with officers to make changes. So they'll be able to keep their choices and their selections up to date, which will then hopefully decrease the number of property refusals that we have because applicants will be selecting the properties and the locations that they, that they want. So we absolutely anticipate that the system will improve performance across a number of areas. Thank you very much, Helen. That's excellent to know. Thank you. And I suppose just in the back of that, Helen, there will always be properties where it's low demand. Nobody wants these properties. And that's where our HAMF comes into play. And that's then when we look at paragraph 36 and we see the rent loss through voids, £701,000. Then that is how we are tackling that by the various actions that we're taking through our policy. Our the HAMF policy, is that right? Through you, Chair. Yes, that's correct. Our, our HAMF framework looks at a variety of factors. So, for example, demand for a property, the length of time it has been empty, the amount of void rent loss accrued, for example. There are a number of factors which take into account what the scoring will be within that HAMF process. So, properties that have been identified as low or no demand will face scrutiny through the HAMF process and that will include um, discussion on a range of possible solutions which could be management action to see what we could do to bring the property back into use and to um, attract interest in the property. It could also be disposal of the property or it could be reconfiguration. There are a number of, of various options as part of the HAMF process but we do work very closely with the area teams to highlight any improvements that we can make to generate demand for our empty properties. Thanks, thanks just for that additional background, Helen. Councillor Hogg, do you want to come in? Yes, thank you. Good morning and thanks, Helen. Um, I think it's a fantastic report and it's good uh, to see the improvements that are being made as well. Can I just go to Indicator 9, the average length of time to complete non-emergency repairs, which is raised slightly. Helen, is this due to a workforce issue and is this something that may be going on in the, the future? Because we know we're having difficulty uh, recruiting to posts. So is this an indicator that um, is due to uh, pressure on our workforce or um, recruiting to our workforce? Through you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor, for your question. It's possibly a factor that through COVID, through absence or through turnover of, of vacancies, it could have been impacted, um, that indicator. However, it was more, um, the performance was more due to restrictions that were in place at the time with regards to access to properties, 
we found quite often that tenants were sometimes quite reluctant to or unable to let us into complete repairs, but also the supply of materials in order to complete them as well. There are challenges when it comes to recruitment across the board, um, not just within housing asset services, but there have been a number of actions identified to promote recruitment um, for example, the recent recruitment of additional modern apprentices within housing asset services and a real focus on how we attract people to work for East Ayrshire Council. Um, so again, it, it may be a factor that it's not uh, it's not an issue that's solely um, experienced by housing asset services, but certainly the managers have in place a really robust um, plan to ensure that we have the, the operatives in place. Thanks, Helen. Does anybody else have any questions? Councillor Maven. Thank you, Chair. Um, not really a question, just a comment on, on the anti-social behaviour. I've, I've had quite a bit of casework with ASB in my own ward, and I'd, I'd like to thank Helen and, and uh, the team that do, do the anti-social behaviour work. They work very well, they engage well, and I know how busy they are, so thank you to that team. If you could pass that on to them for the amount of work they're doing. Um, on the the Taras, I'd, I'd echo what's already been said by a couple of my councillor colleagues about uh, trying to get engagement with some of the the, the Taras. The I don't think I have one active in in the Kilmarnock South Ward. The, there was one in Rickerton, but I believe it's dormant just now. So. I'll, I'm a bit worried about getting the the amount of engagement if we, if we don't if we don't get these um, tenants and residents associations up and active again. Um, it, it tends to be as well that the the same volunteers, the same activists that put time into these things are, are it's the same ones that are going to community councils. They're going to they're helping out at food larders. They're they're on tenants and residents. It's it's the same people again and again who are relying on for for engagement. Thank you. And to add to that, Peter, they're volunteers. And do you know what? And that's the big thing. So and it is important that we cast our net as wide as we can to include as many of our tenants as possible. I mean, there are thousands of tenants that don't want to be involved in groups or whatever. They just want to be themselves, but they would like to be included within surveys in the direction of you know, where council housing, Dakota council housing, and East Ayrshire is going and they want to be part of that discussion and, you know, and have that input. So it really, really is important. And I know that East Ayrshire Tents and Residents Federation do good work and they try their best and they're forever, you know, you know, their energy uh, for the age demographic, if you like, that, that the energy is absolutely amazing. And they're so knowledgeable and they're recognised by the Scottish Government and they do good work here in East Ayrshire. But, you know, I understand the membership of the Federation is very low. So we can't really count in the Federation to be given us, um, you know, information or, you know, survey responses or, you know, to help us inform how we go forward. You know, it's really important that we have a big bigger sample size and they, you know, include as many of our tenants as possible. And and I think, you know, that's that that's been commented you know across across the chamber here this morning. So and I know that you've you've uh, acknowledged it yourself, Helen. So that, that's that's good. Through you, Chair. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Maven, for your comments. And um, we absolutely recognise the challenges with tent participation. There has been a, a real shift in how people want to be communicated with. And that's why we are exploring um, more around um, digital enhancement and, and provision and the services that we provide and the information that we make available to tenants and also how tenants and residents can communicate with us and tell us what they feel and, and what they think. Um, so we are exploring a lot of different methods to really um, improve the engagement that we have. Thanks, Helen. Helen, so can you just explain the difference between an emergency repair and a non-emergency repair and what actions have been highlighted, you know, to reduce 
the response time for the, the non-emergency repairs. Although, you know, I take that that did rise because of the COVID restrictions and the access to the properties. Thank you, through you, Chair. The difference is the time scale uh, required for completion. Um, so an emergency repair would, would be completed a lot quicker than a, a routine repair. The actions that are taken are ensuring that access arrangements are arranged. So enhancing the contact that we have at that first point of contact to make sure that at the point where an operative attends a property, that the tenant knows that we're coming and that we're there to undertake the repair timelessly. Also, we seek feedback from tenants at, during repairs. So we're using that feedback to see how we can enhance the service for tenants when they report a repair as well. So there are a number of, of actions just around um, the processes that are in place at Haas, the technology that's used within housing asset services as well, just to make sure that we are attending at the right time and, and maintaining that high level. So, sorry if you, if you didn't understand me. So if I was a tenant and I phoned in to see that I had a smashed window, is that an emergency repair? And if another tenant phoned in to see that the burst pipe, is that, I don't know, how, how would you gauge emergency, non-emergency? Because I think there's some confusion with some tenants who say, we phone you and they say, I phoned the council to report a whatever and they're still not here. And it's just for my own information, I suppose, as well. Through you, Chair, both would be considered emergency repairs. Um, in the first instance, for example, with a, a smashed window, broken window, then we would be looking for a glazier to attend and, and board up a window and make it safe for the tenant and any neighbours that it might affect. Um, similarly, with a burst pipe, any risk to a property not being wind and watertight, we would obviously seek to, to repair within the emergency time scale. Does anybody want to come in with any comments or questions here? Okay, so see just on the annual performance report to tenants. So it's an annual performance report to tenants. And I know that our performance throughout the year, we can measure that by, you know, so obviously 94.9% um, of antisocial behaviour cases were resolved within the year. And we can measure that because we're measuring that throughout the 12 month process. 12 month period. But when we go into, so if we go to the customer landlord relationship, these are these percentages are based on survey responses from 2020. So that's part of the large scale survey. So actually that's no one annual response, but I take it that it's unchanged from the previous year, but it, this is a, a tenant's document. And I'm thinking about to make it as simple as possible for tenants to read. So I was wondering if consideration could be given to along the lines of, you know, I just putting a wee bit of text in there as based on survey responses from 2020, because tenants might read that and say, oh, last year we were that as well. That's that's really, really good. And we were, but technically it's based on responses from 2020 and not 2022. Is that okay? Is that, David, do you have anything you want to say about that? I was just going to say, I think that's there, but I see you've got that highlighted, so I'm not going to tell you what you know, but uh, there is text around that, that does indicate, I suppose the question is what to be put and should know, because I must have sat here and seen these every year, what do we tell the tenants in the annual report in between the surveys is the question, really. Through you, Chair, we can add some more we can absolutely review the format of the report. We work really closely with the Federation and other partners to, to make it as easy to read and as streamlined and meaningful as possible. We'll absolutely look at that section and, and make sure that it is very clear what the statistics refer to. I mean, it's a good report. The graphics are good and it can hold your attention a wee bit and there's more sort of pictures that always holds my attention more than a lot of text. And it's just how I am. And I suppose a lot of people are like that. If they see too much text, they're like, no reading that, it's kind of annoyed. So it, it can hold your attention. See, just when we go into the plan, Helen, so um, objective 1.2, so page 30. So increased satisfaction levels that relate to dog fouling and fly tipping. And I don't want to reduce this whole thing to dog fouling. Um, but the progress, and it's it's in progress just now, so it's stating that, you know, 
we run promotional campaigns, etc. Um, and, you know, promoting free dog waste bags, etc. Do you want to just give us a wee, a wee update on that position, if, if, if you can? Through you, Chair. We know that the provision of free dog bags is subject to change if budget proposals are accepted. So with regard to that action, that would require a vision within the action plan. Wider work involves engaging with communities um, through vibrant communities, through environmental health and through greener communities when we come to trying to address the problem of dog fouling within areas. The neighbourhood coaches are very active as well within communities and, and are keen to, if there is an issue with dog fouling and allocation, to, to speak to community members and, and try and identify where problems may be coming from. So it's certainly prominent, you'll note, within the survey action plan that it is a key action that our tenants and residents are, are really looking to be addressed. Thanks, thanks, Helen. And just on page 34, just the dampness and condensation. I know we had a, a seminar recently regarding that. Um, I think that was sort of prompted due to the sort of recent media reports. Um, so I think it's about, you know, how to reassure tenants our tenants when they're contacting us and saying I've got dampness and it's not always dampness it's sometimes just the condensation and a wee bit of guidance and advice can can help that but um, it's to reassure the tenants when they report these issues and, and that we respond quickly um, to assess the situation you know because I think that kind of worried a lot of people when they heard the media reports from it was down south it wasn't in Scotland um, but just which I think I've used it. Through you, Chair, it's dampness condensation is a significant challenge for us now, um, more so with the cost of living crisis, and, and you'll be aware of, of situations where our tenants and tenants across the country are are, are unable to, to fund their, their heating costs, and it is a, a real challenge for us in protecting our tenants and also protecting our properties. There's a lot of work being done within the housing sector, the private and social rented sector around dampness con condensation and raising awareness to tenants and staff. And, and we have an action plan within housing services on ensuring that all, all our officers are informed on the reasons for condensation dampness and also able to give advice to tenants on how to, to heat and to ventilate their homes but also, given the cost of living crisis, it's obviously key that officers also know how to give advice on, um, on financial advice for our tenants and how to access supports that may be available to them financially um, or advice on how to look after their home and, and how to look after themselves. So it's a real challenge for us in terms of cost of living and the impacts that it will have on tenants physically and mentally and, and their households and also our properties as we move forward. Okay, well, it's good to know that's a priority, um, Helen, so I take comfort from that. And just my, my final point, um, folk will be glad to hear, <laughs> um, page 30, so it's about garden maintenance. So tenants who have gardens who are unable to maintain their garden but don't qualify for any garden assistance schemes. I mean, how, how, how do we improve in that? And obviously, tenants that can't afford the equipment or to pay for it. So, I mean, how, how do we go around trying to improve, improve that situation for a lot of people? Thank you. Through you, Chair. We have a number of organisations within the third sector across communities who provide garden services who we can signpost tenants to. As you say, we do have our garden maintenance scheme of which there is qualifying criteria. We are also looking at the provision through greener communities of equipment to community groups and looking to establish a network where we will have tenants and residents who perhaps are interested themselves in working alongside those tenants who may be unable to look after their garden 
um, and leasing the, the equipment through East Ayrshire Council. So that's something that we're currently looking at um, through greener communities and with any interested tenants. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Helen. OK, so we go back to the recommendations. Oh, I beg your pardon, Councillor Cockley, beg your pardon. Thanks, Lillian. The damp condensation and mould session is on the 3rd of March. Super, thanks very much. I'll get that in the diary. Thanks, thanks, Sally. So, David, so in terms of the, the recommendations, is there anything that we can maybe put in there just to kind of strengthen um, our engagement process and, and, and to try and capture as many tenants as possible? Is, is there a, a way that we could maybe... Look, there's, there's two options. One is the point's been made and Helen's taken it away and it can be followed up in the action list in the normal way to, to review uh, current arrangements with a view to increasing the involvement, which I think is your point. But it's always in the gift of the committee to add to the recommendations that are presented in the report. And if you wish to escalate it from an action sheet to the minute so it's got visibility, then it would be the same formal words going in as an additional recommendation. But I would suggest you allow sufficient flexibility, etc., rather than being overly prescriptive. So if members are so minded based on the discussion and consideration, then it would be an additional recommendation along the lines of a, a noting the, the two that are there, but also well, before the, the otherwise note, it would be a Roman numeral two, new, and it would be a, to a remit to a, a, the housing and communities a, to a, undertake or, or just to review current arrangements uh, for engagement with our tenants to ensure uh, that these remain fit for purpose and that there are a sufficient numbers and therefore sufficient representation of the overall body of tenants. And well, Stuart's been smart, he'll have written that down. And we'll, and he is, so he has. Uh, we will put that in the draft minute. You can sign off then. But it basically, it would be a remit to, to the, the relevant head of service to review matters and uh, rather than necessarily bring it back a report, reflect any changes in the next presentation, rather than a report that says this is what we're going to do. And then when the next one comes back, given it's annual, it can just be highlighted what action was taken and what impact it's had in terms of hopefully uh, an increase or progress towards an increase in the numbers of members and either the numbers of associ individual associations or the numbers of members in the, the overarching Tenants and Residents Federation. Yeah, members. Oh, Councillor Richardson. Well, I was just going to say thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> listen to my, my councillor colleagues. I think in my ward as well, the residents and tenants association sort of fell away. <clears throat> and we've had a, a meeting or two uh, along with the, the Federation to try and revive it. But uh, on that night, no, t no tenants in the area arrived. And there was two councillors and other council officers there. and. Uh, just unfortunately, no tenants came along. I'm actually thinking that, you know, that it might just be the way the world's changed a bit. You know, and re tenants and residents associations used to play a big part and people used to come along to face-to-face -face meetings. But now I'm thinking it's just the way the world's changed and the digital thing's going to be huge. And I think tenants are probably going to want to interact just direct with the council, sitting at home on their laptop rather than in a cold night going out to a community hall and gathering around a table and having a chat. So I think the I think it might just be that we might want to have action plans to engage with tenants to try and get tenants and residents associations up and running. But it might just be the way the world has changed. And I think going forward, what we'll find as a council, like most councils around Scotland, is that people will just want to sit nice and cosy at home at their dinner, at their dining room table after they've had their meal. And if they've got a problem with their tenancy or they want to raise something with the council, they'll do it online. And that's just the way the world's going. And, you know, we might find as councillors that the days are going along to tenants and residents association meetings, but maybe, you know, maybe they're getting phased out. And it's just the way people want to deal with us rather than anything else. I mean, that's what I've been saying. Um... Councillor Richardson, we, we shouldn't really just depend only on the Federation responses. We have other tenants that we have to try and include. Um, 
but I do take your point and I do think the whole digital thing will have an impact on our elderly tenants mostly. David, do you want to come in? Sure, Chair. I was just I was going to say the old adage used to be you can take a horse to water but you can't make it drink. But I suppose in light of Councillor Richardson's contribution, that kind of begs the question, should we still be trying to take the horse to water or can we, you know, give offer a view from a distance uh, to the same effect? So I think uh, one, it's always good practice to keep all of our arrangements under review. And as technologies change and means of communication change, we tried that argument in relation to councillor surgeries, but it didn't quite work. But uh, as the same proposition, we should always be abreast of the opportunities that present themselves, and we should always, without needing to wait for a formal decision at the end of a year or whatever, be taking advantage of those and building those in. But there's always room for more. So I think what would be proposed is just that kind of light touch review. Officers are aware of concerns. The real issue is, is the Federation truly representative of the rest when it has small numbers? And there are, there are areas that don't have any as associations to then be covered by the umbrella body. So I think the issue then becomes how we communicate with them, how we maybe, you know, help them to grow their numbers of associations and membership of the Federation, and also taking the, the, the Chair's point, your own point, as the means of engagement, but also whether or not it's still robust enough and sufficient enough to rely on the Federation, or whether actually there should be a broader engagement with the wider tenant body, which might, well, the digitisation and online may be something that's easy than it would have been 10 years ago if it was a paper exercise and paper surveys and questionnaires going out to everybody's house. So there are different ways of doing things and I think officers always take that on board and obviously Helen's heard the whole discussion, there'll be a recommendation there that they, they, they review those arrangements as part of the, the, the process of preparing the next one and, and make any uh, changes required in order to maximise the Stuart's writing again, maximise the effectiveness of our arrangements and to ensure we're maximising the opportunities and the participation by tenants. Uh, so it's, let's look at how we do it and let's look at who we're doing it with. And if there are gaps, it's always what we can do to try and fill them, but recognising that, uh, you know, not every area will have an association because in some areas they, 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 there is no not sufficient numbers of people willing to, to get together to, to fulfil that role. But do you accept it's a gap or do you find another way to deal with the tenants there directly? And if it can be done on an online basis, a lot more easier than it maybe was in the past when it made sense to deal with the representative body uh, and invite people to come in through that, then it's maybe easier now than it was in the past to have a wider engagement with all the tenants, which I think is, is the Chair's point. I don't know the answer to that, but that's something that Helen and, and Blair, I'm sure, will, will have a look at and in the context of, of the, the next exercise, uh, see where there might be room for improvement. And I think clearly from this discussion, uh, it would be coming back to highlight like what thinking, what the thinking was, and where it led to any difference of approach or any attempts that have been made to do it differently, even if they didn't succeed. I'm sure Helms written all that down as well. Councillor <laughs> Cannon. Yeah, I think just to be fair, I think that process has already started with the introduction of the Independent Tenants Residents Association. You know, so I think to be fair to officers, they've already started that process, and I think that might be a means of using the teams with the forums. So I mean, I think that's just worth saying. Maybe, um, but if we could build it into the recommendations um, as, a re as, as a review, as you just explained, David. Okay, that in agreement with everybody, happy with that. Yep. Helen, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, folks, so the next item is one that we bring in over from the last meeting. Yeah. So, Included property transactions, and that's over to David. Thanks, Chair Members. Um... This is this is one of our reports that form part of the standard kind of annual programme of of our suite of reports that we bring to governance and scrutiny because at some point in the history of, of the committee it has been determined that these these would be of benefit and of value. Uh, the purpose of the report is to set out all the details of the the property transactions that have been concluded between first April twenty one and March twenty two. These reports normally have a bit of a lag in and we would normally try to present it towards autumn, but 
due to math operational differences, I'll explain the volume of what we're reporting has increased, so it took a little bit longer, and then it was due to, as you say, to come to the December committee, uh, and, and we didn't quite get there, so it's, it's a carryover. So I appreciate that there's issues with the timing, which we'll look to address in the future, and hopefully aim to bring it back in future years, run about the, the June time, August that I push, depending on, on the, the volume and the detail. I had an interesting conversation with, with, with Councillor Cannon yesterday, which which we're talking about always keeping things under perpetual review and, and pausing to reflect. So I've looked again at the covering paper and I think we can improve on that because really uh, the question asked was, you know, why is it here and, and how does it add to the council's scrutiny function? I think at the highest level, putting things in the public domain demonstrates that we have a commitment to openness and transparency and reporting who and how we do business and all of that in the round, be it procurement, property, whatever, is, is all with that view to dispelling that, 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 the, the mythical perception of brown envelopes and dodgy deals done behind closed doors, etc, etc. The answer is no, it's all there, it's done within prescribed parameters, it's done according to due process and we give visibility because we've got nothing to hide as an organisation, so that's at one level. Next, you've got the role of members, which is always to be satisfied that we as officers are properly implementing decisions of Cabinet and Council and Committee and the policies and the rules and processes that are put in place by Council and, and all the committees. And that report is intended to do this, but as I look again at the kind of recovering report wording, I think we need to bring out a bit more and actually set those parameters because the, the starting point is delegated authority. So in terms of the scheme of delegated authority, uh, officers, uh, myself, the uh, finance officer with agreement of a state service uh, can, under delegation, acquire properties uh, up to the value of £1 million. And obviously it would require cabinet approval beyond that. Uh, we don't make many acquisitions, either below or above that line. But the last one, as an example, was the Galaf one, which will be next year's report, which was approved by cabinet. October, um, maybe early November, and uh, the purchase was successfully completed in, in, the, in the 23rd. So the rules are that uh, anything uh, above a million pound would need a cabinet decision. So what you'd be looking for from a scrutiny perception is, is where was the cabinet decision? And I think what we can do is start to just give that information so you can see the follow through. Cabinet made that decision and that's when it was implemented or that, that acquisition or disposal was completed. And for uh, this, the the disposals is anything up to the value of a uh, 100,000 and beyond that it's it's a uh, cabinet approval so it's just about getting business at the right level but where business has been done under delegation there is always that then need to report the outcomes so there is that visibility and transparency so that folk can satisfy themselves uh, that, that as I say actions have been taken in accordance with decisions and policy and that as officers we're not just off in a free-for-all the other advantage of reporting these in the public domain is that in terms of the FOI regime, uh, if you regularly report information, then you don't need to provide individual responses. You can point people to, we report that, you'll find it on the website. So it's in our interest to publish as much information that might be of wider public interest to avoid, uh, you know, folk having to wheedle it out of us by way of an FOI request, because I go back to the point, we've got nothing to hide. So what I would propose to do is in the context of this paper is to actually set out a bit more clearly the delegated authority parameters. And I think the other thing that's important in terms of policy and due process, when you look at the offenders, the large numbers of individual houses that were either buying or selling, they didn't feature even up to two or three years ago. We didn't have that level of business. Uh, that all reflects the uh, impact of, and it's a good positive impact, of uh, the very clear direction housing colleagues went and set in their policies in terms of looking at our ownership of buildings where it's multiple ownership. So if you take the standard four in a block, we used to, you know, maybe have two, maybe have one in a block, and then you've got all the issues that I know some members have, 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 have been exposed to in your ordinary duties in terms of, of of appointing factors and getting repairs done in the basis of, of collective
of agreement of disparate and multiple owners. So the policy position, and again, I think it'd be helpful and acceptable, it'd be helpful to set that out for the benefit of the public and, 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 and the wider readership uh, would be, or is that the council took the decision that we will either uh, sell where we only maybe own one or two and there's no prospect of acquiring full ownership and we will buy uh, where we can uh, with a view to consolidating full ownership. In other words, if we don't have four in a block, we're not going to sit with one or two. We'll divest or sell the one or two because it's simply easier to manage and control with full ownership. So those are the policies that were put in place at one of our November housing cabinets, special shows, uh, and that's what we're implementing. And what you then see is the impact on council business because uh, other than uh, the HRA now funding a paralegal in conveyancing, then all of that work has been done in-house by the existing conveyancing contracts team. What I would also set out and explain here and will cover, I think we can do better in the covering paper going forward because that probably was written as a template before half of what I'm discussing now was actually uh, occurred. But uh, the other thing to be aware of is the approach we take. So in relation to, for instance, to the disposals of housing, we, we now use estate agents because there is nothing to be gained by marketing them individually ourselves. And that's the game of the estate agents is to market properties. So the process is quite simply when a house is identified under the policy as being surplus to requirements because it's one or two in a block of four, then it goes we, we put them in batches to the estate agents. The estate agents receive X number of offers and they just do it. And, and it's a bit frightening for me because we're all like we're delegated reports, but it just comes in in an email now and it's a simple as there's the property, there's the home valuation report, because that's part of the policy. We the, the, the delegated authority in relation to this is we can only agree if it's above a, or you know, the policy is we will only accept offers that at least match the home valuation report. And the second part of the policy, you'd be glad to know is quite simply, we will always accept the highest offer, provided it's not heavily conditioned. So it's the highest clean offer. We'll look at them with conditions, but if somebody's saying, I'll take that, but I want to turn it into a hotel and it'll be subject to planning, then for the sake of five grand, you might sell it to the one that says, I'll take it without waiting for planning. But in the main, we will take uh, the, the highest offer and they're not usually qualified because it's just people wanting to buy houses to move into them. So the paper trail, if it were to be audited, is quite simply the state agent reports, the number of offers we got, the names and the value. Where there are companies, I do what checks I can in terms of companies' house. Sometimes you recognise them. There are companies you know, local property developers, you recognise them and they come in, they get some. But in the main, uh, if we have a preference and if we can exercise a preference, it's always to sell to individuals and private owners. But if it's a company that comes in to develop it for a private landlord and they're the highest bidder, then we will have to, you know, we, we will accept that because we've got the best value duty as well. Uh, so we only we only accept them if they're above the HRV in the norm and we only accept the highest. So it's actually almost a decision that takes itself because all we're really doing is confirming that we actually instruct the state agent to then tell uh, the, the highest bidder to go and get their offer in via the lawyers and then it comes into legal and we take it from there and so on and so forth. So that's uh, the parameters and therefore it's within those parameters that you're looking at this and you would want to be satisfied that everything was. And I think what we then do is make it an exceptions report because there will very occasionally be a property that we've maybe marketed and the HRV is maybe you know quite low anyway but not low enough and if you market something once twice you know try not to do it three times but if you've marketed it a couple of times and you're not getting any bids and you've got the state agent telling you uh, you know what what is happening in that local market in that settlement in that town or village or community then you know it's never wise to pay, uh, engage external experts and then ignore their advice. So very occasionally we might, by exception, uh, take an offer that's less than HRV because it's been out and there's been no offers at HRV and it's been out again. And you wouldn't want us to waste too much time chasing pennies and spending pounds to do so. So, But what we can do is flag up in this report and future iterations those which are out with the policy. And again, that allows you to fulfil your function of being satisfied that the activities we're undertaking, the things we do when we're not at meetings uh, boring you with these reports, uh, is in line with the decisions taken by 
cabinet and the, the policies and processes put in place by council and, and cabinet. So it's against that backdrop that, that as I said, everything I've said there we will build into the future report so it's clear to any reader that there are rules and parameters within which is done in the purpose of the report is to allow you to satisfy yourself that that's what's happening and also just to for I think genuine, a genuine interest because there's always a level of interest with members as to what's happening in their particular ward. So with those comments, I thought back for you, Chair, to members if there's anything else, but what I'm undertaking to do is amend the covering paper to give better, clear context to the purpose of this report to enable members to get better value out of it. And I'll, I'll, I'll rest on that just now, Chair. Thanks, David. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's anything for an improvement, just to make it clear to members and to the public. Yeah, that's a good a good question. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, see the money that comes, David. See the money that comes in through the disposals, and that's just thinking about our overall stock. The money that the council receives from disposals, does that is that earmarked to then be used for the properties that we want to acquire, or can it be used for other uses? The the as I, the report does make maybe not too clear, but it does say in the report and the presentation the appendix says it's split between the general fund and the HRA. So basically, the receipts from the HRA properties go back into the HRA, and they are spent in accordance with the decisions of cabinet every November when Blair comes with his suite of housing papers and sets out his housing capital program. So that's based on well, well that amount of income that will go in. So they estimate what they'll have to spend, and then cabinet tells them how to spend it. So yes, it is always the HRA is always confined to the HRA. So the 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 income in the capital receipts in for the sale of the council house, the former council house stock, uh, remains in the HRA and then is is directed to investing in the properties that remain in accordance with the program that's approved each November uh, at the housing cabinet. Thanks, David. Yeah, that's that's clear. Sorry, sorry, everybody. Um, with regards to the page 41 and the, the subjects acquired, the Savic Catron uh, for 325 grand, I went online and had a wee look at it and it looked at like a brilliant redevelopment. You've got the, the Civic Centre at the front. I think there's a kind of heritage centre at the rear. I just wondered, because um, obviously, you know, we're, some of us are very, very new to the council, but I know, I know that we've been trying to do... Um, you know, the community centres, etc. We've been trying to put them into the uh, the ownership of the local people. I just wondered why we purchased a community centre in Catron when community centres across the across the, um, the the authority we seem to be trying to, you know, put them into the ownership and being run by the the local people. Can I go, Chair? Not can I go? <laughs> Not answer it. <laughs> uh, no, the the point I made earlier about uh, it might be helpful where if it's done under cabinet authority, we would now signpost in this paper the relevant cabinet report because that goes back to I think about 2018. All I would say is, is there was particular circumstances around that one. Right. The building had actually been acquired by an external local group and cut a very long story short and there are probably folk watching this and well, whenever we issue it, it's not live, but there will probably be folk watching this, listening to every word that we say now. But the bottom line is, is that uh, that was acquired uh, directly by an external group, uh, having acquired uh, mostly external funding, uh, but there had been a loan from the council. And for reasons I'm certainly not going to go into here in open session, uh, the group found themselves in a precarious financial position and the group found themselves unable to repay the loan. And in lieu of repayment of that loan, the council agreed to take ownership of the building. And it was in that basis, it wasn't really in furtherance of policy or the, contrary to the general cap policy, it was a specific decision in a specific situation that saw the council get some value for a loan, which in terms of principal and interest 
had got somewhere near five to six hundred thousand pound outstanding. So the council uh, and Joe can explain better financial matters. But rather than the, uh, there not being an option of writing it off, the option was taken of the building being transferred into council ownership. Uh, so therefore, well, it, it was a purchase in the sense of. £325,000 of debt was written off against it and therefore it was for value and we acquired an asset at that valuation. I think we'd had it valued at fee 20 and they had it valued at fee 25 so we didn't quibble for £5,000. But the bottom line is, is it wasn't a straight purchase in the sense of the council needs a facility, let's go and buy that. It yeah. was more complicated and it was the outcome from quite a tortuous uh, engagement with the group and all the other external funders that I'd rather have not relived. But there you go. Uh, so in essence, that's an exceptional one. But I'll, uh, the cabinet paper was, I think, August 2018, and uh, that sets it out in painstaking detail. Thanks for that response. They'd obviously been a relatively new council just coming on board May last year. I didn't know the backstory to it, but that, that explains that. Thanks for that. That's I'm sorry, Anybody else? Any questions? Councillor Mayfield? Thank you, Chair. Um, just who would I ask for a bit more detail about one one of the the properties or lands? Would it would it be down to Blair Miller and the, the housing or? Not being funny, it would depend which one because there's housing and non-housing in here. So if you went, if, if well, it was Appendix A. It was the plot of land at 61, 63 Watt Ridge Road. Because I've, I've been in Google Maps and for the life of me, I can't find it. Right. Uh, that would be probably a state. I'll, I'll take undertake because the colleagues in the states will have it as well. Looking at the way that's described in the value, I would probably put my money on that being simply a disposal of an area that was in our ownership for somebody to take into the garden. We quite often get little things like that where somebody maybe at the end of their street wants to expand their garden and they establish that we maybe have a bit of ground at the side at the end of that street left over from when the houses were formed and people will come and say, look, can I can I have that? I'll take that off you. You don't need to cut it anymore. I'll own it and then I'll bring it into my garden, which is generally seen to improve the amenity and reduce the council having to go and cut small bits of grass where we've ended up still owning them, having you know inherited the housing stock over, over decades. So I suspect that will be no more than a uh, garden ground, uh, but we'll we'll get that checked out. I'll just uh, ask the state's colleagues to confirm and uh, remind me what the detail was, and we'll, we'll provide that to you. But I think it's probably garden ground uh, rather than anything else. It's okay. not the shop. The shop is assessing the gardens. It'll just be something I dispose at that price. And what we do there is we don't actively market small bits of ground because it costs more necessarily. But if people come along and they've got a special interest and there's no real other interest because it's just a bit of grass at the end of the street, then it often makes sense for one of those adjoining properties if they're willing to take it in and want to take it in and you can get a, a reasonable capital receipt, then it makes sense to, to tidy things up in terms of our ownership. So I suspect it was garden ground, but I'll, I'll, I'll get that one checked and drop you a note. Or if you want, I can, if it's through you, Chair, I can drop it to all members or I can just drop it to Councillor Maven. I'll drop it to you. That's great. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, so the recommendations, page 37, just to note the report. Thank you. So, item six, the final item, David, awarding of contracts period from 19th of August to 17th of November 2022. Thanks, Chair. And again, this was one that was due to come in December. Uh, this is quarterly rather than annual. <laughs> and again, uh, this is one that I referred to earlier in terms of the suite of regular reports we bring to governance and scrutiny. And again, everything I said before applies here in terms of trying to promote visibility of the business we do and trying to promote uh, and offer assurance through doing that uh, against the integrity of the processes by which we invite bids, evaluate bids and award contracts on the back of those evaluations. And what it gives is that visibility of not just the contracts that were awarded and the range and nature of business that we do, but who we're doing business with and who else had the opportunity to bid and also an indication of the basis in which a contractor was awarded it. And I go back to the comments I made earlier about, you know, offering assurance and then highlighting exceptions. And in most instances, we've 
of award them on the basis of uh, meat, most economically advantageous tender, and then we indicate what that actually meant in terms of was it purely the price or was it a price quality split and what was the percentage split on the evaluation process. And that will vary from contract to contract, whether it's one where price is, is the essence of it and there's no real quality element to no, it's not just about getting something at the cheapest price, it's actually getting a good quality service at a reasonable price and that would give you a, a higher quality percentage in that evaluation and there's no one approach uh, fits all. We adjust the approach commensurate with uh, striking that balance with the client service of what is it we're procuring here, how much do we spend and uh, what is it we're asking them to supply and how do they supply it and what does a quality submission look like. So there's no point in bringing quality in if you know everybody's just being asked for a price to bring you know 200 tyres in the back of a lorry every week uh, or pencils or whatever. Uh, it's the, the quality goes into, well, you know, what are you offering for delivery? What's your delivery charge? Those kind of things. So it's never as straightforward as just the price only. And there's no one 50-50 price quality split. We adjust that as appropriate, uh, depending how much the, the focus is on cost, price, best value, and how much there needs to be a balanced consideration of the quality of the service we're trying to procure, whether it's a service to support other services or in some cases a service that will actually be provided directly to perhaps local businesses, the economic development or others. As I always say, we as paper chair and members know, it does demonstrate, even in that quarterly snapshot, the absolute width and depth and it's actually quite scary in terms of the range of services councils you know, have to actually provide. And when you see the detail and the nature of some of the things and services and goods that we need to then procure to support services delivering uh, what they deliver, then it does bring in one place just that full width, depth and range of just how much and how complex an organisation a local authority is when you look at the big picture. As, as as well as when we tend to look at things, you know, in focus and in, in their own context. And uh, it's actually quite staggering when you see it all there, because every bit's recognisable. Well, well, I remember that, and I remember that, and the rendering, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you actually see it all in one place, it just gives that flavour and indication of the actual scale and what it means when we say it's a three hundred and fifty million pound a year organisation with a two hundred and fifty million pound uh, revenue budget. So I'll leave it at that, Chair. If there's any particular inquiries about any specific contracts, and, uh, and again, in line with the last one, uh, we'll probably just have a look whether we can refresh the covering report uh, to make clear what it is you are being asked to, to, to look at uh, when we bring these forward. Thanks, David. I'm sorry, Justin. Thanks, Chair. Um, David, it was just the uh, the one uh, on page 44, 2.2 housing, uh, the contract external envelope and handsome, handsome program, program um, granted to Hugh McConnell Limited. It's just the size of the contract and there is there is some information underneath it which, it, which is pretty good, but obviously it was estimated value 28 million, the, the winning bid was 20, just over 29.6 million. But just as a, a member of the committee, um, I mean, it tells us good information underneath that contract, for instance, that, you know, there's uh, going to be community benef benefit fund coming back, £2,000 per area in Auchinleck, Drungan and Muir Kirk. Uh, you know, our own East Ayrshire Council apprentice, roofers and plasterers will get on-site work experiences. So that's all great to know, but I just wondered if housing would be able in future to... The contract's obviously going to run to March 2024. I mean, I'm just wondering if there's any scope to let the committee members know for that 29.6 million, you know, how many houses in these areas are we planning to re-roof or re-plaster? What, what does the count, what does East Ayrshire Council expect to get for that 29.6 million? Would that be possible to, to build that into the report? It would, but I think we'd be duplicating. You've got to wind back to the point I made about these reports are to show the actions we take and further as a council decisions. All of that information in terms of what the council's allocating to spend on the, the re-rough casting or the re-rendering of properties is what's approved by Count Cabinet annually in the Housing Capital Programme. 
This is just the contractor who will deliver. So he's not away delivering something members aren't cited on. This is the contractor who will deliver that element of the capital programme that was approved uh, by Cabinet and is approved on an annual basis. So Blair comes every year and puts in front of members at Cabinet, this is the areas I'm planning to do, this is the order, this is where they will go, this is the money I'm allocating. And that's what informs the 28 million estimate. So the 28 million estimate goes back to the programme that was approved and most recently approved in November. So the detail is there. Uh, so, you know, maybe I'll, I'll maybe see if we can link it back. That again might be benefit rather than repeating it all here. And I'll be honest, I'm back to where I was at a previous meeting when I tried to do it for home and I was the magnifying glass out because my eyes are so bad I can't read that small print. So apologies to the rest of you. Uh, yeah, I think that's what we would do. Just as I said about the Civic one would have benefited. What we'll do there is is just make the reference, you know, for delivery of the the housing capital program and the cabinet approval, and that's where you would get the information about they would do rather than replicate it here in the small print. Well, that's that's absolutely fine, David. That 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 would be great. It's just, it's just when you're reading these papers and obviously you're you're looking at contracts, you know, twenty eight million pound. You know, it's just so that you just so there's a wee reference somewhere that you can go and see well. What what are we getting for that money? That that would be brilliant. Um, Dave's will get that sorted for you. Okay. I think that's the way to go. We'll link it by and 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 highlight. You know, a. Uh... And, and, and you know, what does this relate to? It relates to the delivery of the housing capital programme last approved at Cabinet in such a day. There you go. And and then a, a link might be, I don't know if that's possible, I know, Dano, but you know, a link or a reference to it, and then the reader can go and see what it is cab Cabinet approved, because this is just putting a contractor in place to deliver those decisions. It's not, as I say, absolutely to go and do something else on top of it, Cabinet approved. So it's maybe just linking it back to the Cabinet approval. And there's the full report in which Blair set out his ambition for the number of properties and the location and priority, uh, et cetera, of the properties in the order he's planning to do them. And that details all there, and that's what then informs the contract. So I think that's probably the easier way is to link you back to the approved program that this will be in furtherance of. Excuse me. Thanks, David. I think that would help, especially when the membership of the committee is newly elected members so it does that helps you point in direction then you'll see things all tying up because it's just like a thread off through the different committees is there any more comments or questions for david in this paper online no no just a comment it's good to see the commandant bus station one in there and let's hope that that'll be sorted within the 38 weeks and lift that area okay okay folks so can we just agree the recommendation to note the report Thank you very much. Thank you all for your input today. See you later. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you.